This is Shadow of Man, Chapter 5. The Rains Soon after Van's departure, the light rains of the chimpanzee's spring gave place to the long rains. Showers became deluges, which sometimes lasted with unabated fury for two hours or more. One of those wild storms, which occurred a week or so after the change of seasons, I shall long remember. For two hours, I'd been watching a group of chimpanzees feeding in a huge fig tree. It had been grey and overcast all morning, with thunder growling in the distance. At about noon, the first heavy drops of rain began to fall. The chimpanzees climbed out of the tree, and one after the other plodded up the steep grassy slope towards the open ridge at the top. There were seven adult males in the group, including Goliath and David Greybeard, several females and a few youngsters. As they reached the ridge, the chimpanzees paused. At that moment, the storm broke. The rain was torrential, and the sudden clap of thunder right overhead made me jump. As if this was a signal, one of the big males stood upright and as he swayed and swaggered rhythmically from foot to foot, I could just hear the rising crescendo of his pantoots above the beating of the rain. Then he charged off, flat out, down the slope towards the trees he had just left. He ran some thirty yards, and then, swinging round the trunk of a small tree to break his headlong rush, leapt into the low branches and sat motionless. Almost at once, Two other males charged after him. One of them broke off a branch from a tree as he ran and brandished it in the air before hurling it ahead of him. The other, as he reached the end of his run, stood upright and rhythmically swayed the branches of a tree back and forth before seizing a huge bough and dragging it further down the slope. A fourth male, as he too charged, leapt into a tree and almost without breaking his speed, tore off a large branch, leapt with it to the ground and continued down the slope. As the last two males called and charged down, so the one who had started the whole performance climbed from his tree and began the plodding up the slope again. The others, who had also climbed into trees near the bottom of the slope, followed suit. And then, when they reached the ridge, they started charging down all over again, one after the other, with equal vigour. The females and youngsters had climbed into trees near the top of the rise as soon as the displays had begun, and there they remained, watching throughout the whole performance. As the males charged down and plodded back up, so the rain fell harder and harder, jagged forks or brilliant flares of lightning lit the leaden sky, and the crashing of the thunder seemed to shake the very mountain. My enthusiasm was not merely scientific as I watched, enthralled from my grandstand seat on the opposite side of the narrow ravine, sheltering under a sheet of polythene. In fact, it was raining and blowing far too hard for me to get at my notebook or use my binoculars. I could only watch and marvel at the magnificence of these splendid creatures. With a display of strength and vigour such as this, primitive man himself might have challenged the elements. Twenty minutes from the start of the performance, the last of the males plodded back up the slope for the last time. The females and youngsters climbed down from their trees, and the whole group moved over the crest of the ridge. One male paused, and with his hand on a tree trunk, looked back. The actor taking his final curtain. Then he too vanished over the ridge. I continued to sit for a while, staring almost in disbelief at the white scars on the tree trunks and the discarded branches on the grass, all that remained in that rain-splashed landscape to prove that the wild rain dance had taken place at all. I should have been even more amazed had I known then that I should only see such a display twice more in the next ten years. Often, indeed, male chimpanzees react to the start of heavy rain by performing a rain dance, 
but this is usually an individual affair. Yet I have only to close my eyes to see again in vivid detail that first spectacular performance. As the rainy season progressed, the grass shot up until it was over 12 feet in some places, and even on the exposed ridges, it often reached a height of at least six feet. When I left the tracks, which I knew, if indeed I could find them at all, I couldn't tell where I was going and had to stop every so often and climb a tree to get my bearings. Also, I was no longer able to sit down whenever I happened to be or wherever was convenient when I came across a group of chimpanzees, for usually my view would then be totally obscured by grass. I have never been able to work with binoculars for long periods of time when standing, so I had either to bend down hundreds of grass stems or else climb a tree. As the rainy season progressed, I became increasingly arboreal in my habit, but despite my love for trees, it was not very satisfactory for I lost time both in looking for a suitable tree and in breaking away branches that obstructed my view of the chimpanzees. And when there was a wind, which was often, I couldn't keep the binoculars steady anyway. I found it difficult also to shield my binoculars from the rain. I made a sort of polythene tube, which kept out much of the wet, and I pulled a large piece of polythene forward over my head like a peaked cap when I was watching chimps. Even so, there were many days when I couldn't use my binoculars because they were clouded over inside with droplets of condensed moisture. Even when it was not actually raining, the long grass remained drenched nearly all day, either with rain or the heavy nightly dew. And there were periods when I seemed to be wet through for days on end. Indeed, I think I spent some of the coldest hours of my life in those mountains, sitting in clammy clothes in an icy wind watching chimpanzees. There was even a time when I dreaded the early morning climb to the peak. I left my warm bed in the darkness, had my slice of bread and cup of coffee by the cosy glow of a hurricane lamp, and then had to steel myself for the plunge into that icy water-drenched grass. After a while, though, I took to bundling my clothes into a polythene bag and carrying them. There was no one to see my ascent, and it was dark anyway. Then, when I knew there were dry clothes to put on when I reached my destination, the shock of the cold grass against my naked skin was a sensual pleasure. For the first few days, my body was crisscrossed by scratches from the tooth-edged grass. But after that, my skin hardened. One morning, in the first grey light of dawn, I plodded up the last steep slope to the peak. As I reached the top, my foot seemed to freeze in mid-air, for there, no less than four yards from me, a lone buffalo lay, half hidden in the long grass. He must have been asleep, or surely he would have heard me and luckily the breeze was blowing his rich cow-like scent directly into my nostrils. Had it been the other way round, as it was, I was able to creep quietly away, and he was not disturbed. It was at this time, too, that a leopard actually passed within a few yards of me as I sat in some long grass. I never knew he was there until I saw the white tip of his tail just ahead of me, and there was no time to retreat, so I just held my breath. I doubt if he ever knew how close to a human he had been. On the whole, I loved that rainy season at Gombe. It was cool most of the time, and there was no heat to distort my long-distance observations. I've always loved to feel myself an integral part of nature, and the crunching of my feet on the crackling leaf carpet of the forest floor in the dry season had always bothered me. When the leaves became soft and damp during the rains, I could move through the trees silently and catch more than fleeting glimpses of some of the shyer creatures. Best of all, of course, I was continually learning more and more about chimpanzees and their behaviour. In the dry season, the chimpanzees 
I knew usually rested on the ground at midday, for I'd often glimpsed them lying stretched out in the shade. In the rainy season, though, the ground is frequently sodden, and I found the chimpanzees made quite elaborate day nests on which to rest. To my surprise, they often made these whilst it was still actually raining, and then sat hunched up with their arms around their knees and their heads bowed until the rain stopped. In the mornings, they got up later too, and quite often, after feeding or just sitting about for two or three hours, made new nests and lay down again. I suppose this was because they sometimes had such miserably wet and cold nights that they couldn't sleep and so were tired in the morning. They usually went to bed earlier too, sometimes when I left the chimps in their nests, soaking wet from a late afternoon storm. I felt not only desperately sorry for them, but guilty because I was returning to a hot meal, dry clothes and a tent. And I felt even worse when I woke in the middle of the night to hear the rain lashing down on the canvas and thought of all the poor huddled chimps shivering on their leafy platforms while I snuggled cosily into my warm, dry bed. Sometimes at the beginning of a storm, a chimpanzee would shelter under an overhanging trunk or tangle of vegetation. But then when the rain began to drip through, he or she usually emerged and just sat, hunched and looking miserable in the open. Small infants seemed to fare the best in a heavy storm. Quite often I saw old Flo, who of all the females was least afraid of me at the time, sitting hunched over two-year-old Fifi. At the end of the deluge, Fifi would crawl from her mother's embrace, looking completely dry. Flo's son, Figgen, about four years older than Fifi, often swung wildly through the tree on such occasions, dangling from one hand and kicking his legs, leaping from branch to branch, jumping up and down above old Flo until she was showered with debris and hunched even lower to avoid the twigs that lashed her face. It was a good way of keeping his blood warm, rather like the wild rain display with which older males often greeted the start of heavy rain. As the weeks went by, I found that I could usually get closer to a group of chimpanzees when it was cold and wet than when the weather was dry. It was as though they were too fed up with the conditions to bother about me. One day I was moving silently through the dripping forest. Overhead the rain pattered on the leaves and all around it dripped from leaf to leaf to the ground. The smell of rotten wood and wet vegetation was pungent. Under my hands, the tree trunks were cold and slippery and alive. I could feel the water trickling through my hair and running warmly into my neck. I was looking for a group of chimps I'd heard before the rain began. Suddenly, only a few yards ahead of me, I saw a black shape hunched up on the ground with its back to me. Quickly, I hunched down onto the ground myself. The chimp hadn't seen me. For a few minutes there was silence, save for the pattering of the rain. And then I heard a slight rustle and a soft ooh to my right. Slowly I turned my head, but I saw nothing in the thick undergrowth. When I looked back, the dark shape that had been in front of me had vanished. Then came a sound from above. I looked up and there saw a large male directly overhead. It was Goliath. He stared down at me with his lips tensed and very slightly shook a branch. I looked away for a prolonged scare can be interpreted as a threat. I heard another rustle to my left and when I looked I could just make out the black shape of a chimp behind a tangle of vines. When I looked ahead I saw two eyes staring towards me and a large hand gripping a hanging liana. Another soft ooh this time from behind, I was surrounded. All at once, Goliath uttered a long drawn out, rah, and I was showered with rain and twigs as he threatened me, shaking the branches. The call was taken up by the other dimly seen chimps. 
To me, it is one of the most savage sounds of the African forests, second only to the trumpeting scream of an enraged elephant. All my instincts bade me flee, yet I forced myself to stay there, trying to appear disinterested and pretending to eat roots from the ground. The end of the branch above me hit my head. With a stamping and slapping of the ground, a black shape charged through the undergrowth ahead, veering away from me at the last minute and running at a tangent into the forest. I think I expected to be torn to pieces. I don't know how long I crouched there, tensed and horrified, before I realised that everything was still and silent, save for the drip, drip of the raindrops. Cautiously, I looked round. The black hand and the glaring eyes were no longer there. The branch where Goliath had been was deserted. All the chimpanzees had gone. Admittedly, my knees shook a little when I got up, but there was that sense of exhilaration that comes when danger has threatened and left one unharmed. And the chimpanzees were surely less afraid of me. It lasted for about five months, this period of aggression and hostility towards me, following the initial fear and hasty retreat that had before taken place whenever the chimps saw me. There's one other incident which stands out in my memory. It took place about three weeks after the one I've just described. I was waiting on one side of a narrow ravine, hoping that chimpanzees would arrive in a fruit-laden tree on the opposite slope. When I heard the deliberate footsteps of approaching chimpanzees behind me, I lay down flat and kept still, for often if the apes saw me on their way to feed, they changed their minds and fed elsewhere. Once they'd started to feed, however, once they were surrounded by the delicious taste and sight and smell of the fruit, their hunger usually proved stronger than their distrust of me. On this occasion, the footsteps came on and suddenly stopped quite close. There was a soft whoo, the sound of a worried, slightly fearful individual. I'd been seen. I kept quite still and presently the footsteps came even closer. Then I heard one chimpanzee suddenly run for a few yards. This was followed by a loud scream. What on earth, I wondered, was happening? A moment later, I saw a male chimpanzee climbing a tree only a couple of yards away. He moved over into the branches above my head and began screaming at me, short, loud, high-pitched sounds with his mouth open. I stared up into his dark face and brown eyes. He began climbing down towards me until he was no more than ten feet above me and I could see his yellow teeth and right inside his mouth, the pinkness of his tongue. He shook a branch, showering me with twigs. Next, he hit the trunk and shook more branches, and all the while continued to scream and scream and work himself into a frenzy of rage. Suddenly, he climbed down and went out of sight behind me. It was then that I saw a female with a tiny baby and an older child sitting in another tree, and staring at me with wide eyes. They were quite silent and quite still. I could hear the old male moving about behind me, and then his footsteps stopped. It was so close I could hear his breathing. It seemed unreal. All at once there was a loud bark, a stamping in the leaves, and my head was hit hard. At this I had to move, had to sit up, had to believe it was all really happening. The male was standing looking at me and for a moment I believed he would charge, but he turned and moved off, stopping to turn and stare at me several times. The female and youngster climbed down silently and moved after him. A few moments later I was alone again, my heart beating rather fast, but I felt a sense of triumph. I had made real contact with a wild chimpanzee, or perhaps it should be the other way round. He made contact with me. When I looked back some years later at my description of that male 
I'm certain it was the bad-tempered, irascible, paunchy J.B. The behaviour fits in perfectly with the irritable, fearless character that I later came to know so well. I suppose he was puzzled by my immobility and the sheet of polythene that was protecting me from the light rain. He simply had to find out exactly what I was and make me move. He must have known from my eyes that I was alive. It was after incidents of this sort that I longed to return to camp and find Van there, so that I could share with her the horror or the delight of the occasion. But I told Dominic and her son about my encounter with the old male, and they in turn told Edie Matata. He came to see me the following evening, and recounted the story of an African who had climbed halfway up a palm tree to collect the ripe fruit, without noticing that a male chimp was feeding up at the top. The ape suddenly saw him and rushed down, hitting out at the African's face as he passed. The man lost one eye, and so the rumour went around that I had some magic about me, that I went unharmed where others were hurt, that I was no ordinary English girl at all. It all helped my friendly relations with my African neighbours. The long rain should end during April, I'd been told, but that year it was still raining in June, although less frequently. In between the cold grey days, the whole area was like a gigantic tropical greenhouse. The moisture that was sucked up by the sun from the lush vegetation of the mountains was trapped in the valleys, trapped between the long grass stems. Climbing the steep slopes was often a nightmare. Sometimes I felt I simply had to climb into a tree in order to breathe. And once I was up there, I wondered why on earth our ancestors had ever left the branches. I think when I look back over that May and June that they were the worst of all my early months, worse even than the time when the chimpanzees fled at my approach. I had several returns of fever. Often it was an effort to lift a hand, so bad was the humidity, let alone struggle up mountains. And the chimpanzees, who had been feeding in large, noisy groups, were splitting up more and more, often into small units of two to six. Frequently, such groups made no sounds all day as they wandered through the forests, feeding on the fruit of the ubiquitous mbula tree, known as wild custard apples. Gradually, however, the terrible humidity lessened. Strong winds blew daily down through the valleys, and my spirits and health were restored. The wild fig season came round again, and this time, instead of watching from the peak, I was able to move down into the valley and sit quite close to the trees where the chimpanzees fed each day. Once, as I was watching a group in a tree about 30 yards away, I heard a slight rustle in the leaves behind me. I looked round, and there, 15 feet away, sat a chimpanzee with his back to me. I kept quite still, thinking he hadn't seen me, but after a few moments he glanced casually at me over his shoulder, then went on chewing. He stayed there for another ten minutes, sometimes giving me a quick look before finally walking away. That was Mike, an adult male with a face almost as handsome as that of David Greybeard. The incident took place a few weeks after that never-to-be-forgotten day described at the beginning of the book when David Greybeard and Goliath also sat calmly only a few feet away from me. Their original fear of me had gradually given place to aggression and hostility, and now many of the chimps had begun to accept me as part of their normal everyday landscape. A strange white ape, very unusual to be sure, but not, after all, terribly alarming. Towards the end of August, my sister Judy arrived from England. The National Geographic Society, which was by then financing my research, was of course interested in obtaining photographs for the magazine. The Society wanted to send a professional photographer, but I was terrified at the thought of a stranger arriving on the scene and ruining my hard-won relationship with the chimps. I suggested to Lewis that Judy should come out, 
not because she had any photographic experience, but because she looked like me and would be willing to sacrifice chances of getting pictures for the good of my work. The National Geographic Society did not finance her trip, but a British weekend newspaper took a gamble and paid all her expenses in return for a series of interviews with me when I returned to England. Poor Judy, when she arrived it was virtually the end of the dry season, a dry season that had lasted no more than six weeks. I had built small hides near trees, which I expected to fruit during September and October, but the crops were poor that year, and it rained nearly every day. Judy spent hours and hours waiting in hides in the pouring rain, trying to shelter herself and her photographic paraphernalia under a sheet of polythene. The chimps hardly ever came, and when they did, it was raining too hard for Judy to take a single picture. However, during November, things cheered up a little, and she was able to take some of the first ever pictures of chimpanzees using tools as they fished for termites. Also, she got some shots of me in camp life and the fishermen, which made her trip worthwhile so far as her sponsors were concerned. When Judy first arrived at the Gombe stream, she was horrified at my emaciated appearance. For 18 months, apart from an occasional Kigoma day, or short periods when fever had laid me low, I'd worked full time in the mountains. My alarm clock was always set for 5.30 in the morning, and after a slice of bread and a cup of coffee, I hurried off after my chimps. I never felt the need for food when I was roaming the forest. Indeed, I was lucky enough to require no water either, except on rare occasions. The cups of coffee I made on the peak were luxuries. And then, after returning to camp as darkness fell, there were always my notes to transcribe. Often I was working until far into the night. No wonder I'd lost weight. Judy felt it her duty to fatten me up. Accordingly, she ordered such things as porridge and custard, Bourneville and Horlicks, but somehow I never felt like eating them, and since Judy couldn't bear to see them wasted, she ate them herself. In December, we had to pack up camp in the pouring rain, of course, and store all my equipment in Kigoma. For Lewis Leakey had managed to get me admitted to Cambridge University to work for a PhD in ethology, the study of animal behaviour. I was to be one of the few students admitted to a PhD programme without ever having sat for a BA degree. Lewis met Judy and me in Nairobi and sent a cable to Van. It read, Girls arrived safely. Stop. One thin, one fat. Stop. Poor Judy.